Welcome, welcome to our home in Jerusalem. So Adrian, her husband is a contractor. So hopefully while he's home now, he's fixing everything. So I'm very fortunate because my husband is a rabbi and it comes in handy when it comes to Passover. Now, how is this Passover different than all other Passovers? Well, I have to tell you, you know, I don't have to tell you how different it is. We can hold mixed emotions. The, at a certain point, we're going to take a vegetable, the karpas, and we're going to dip it in the salt water. And it represents the tears of the Jewish people. So in the last few weeks, there are times I'm crying because I'm so blessed and I'm so grateful. And there are times I'm crying because I'm so fearful, so worried, and feeling the pain of all those around me. You can hold both together. So as we go through the Seder, you're going to have the joy and the meaning of it even mixed with what's happening today historically. And I have to tell you that there are, my son Zev said that there are more satyrs in the world this year than any time in history. Because normally the Plavniks are together in, at our seder and there's one, and now it's honeymoon Passover, honeymoon Pesach. It's the honeymoon seder because it's just me and my husband and all our children for the first time, and it was unplanned obviously, that they're suddenly leading their own seders. So we are, we are very blessed to be together. Some of you are, you're alone, you're alone. And I have to tell you that even though we're so sad not to be with our kids, what I have in mind is that next year's Seder, this year's Seder could be the most meaningful, next year's Seder could be the most joyous. Because some of you have relatives like Uncle Lou and like you, you know, he comes to the Seder and he's got different politics and he's a real pain, next year, you're gonna be so happy to see Uncle Lou because we're all gonna to be together again. So without further ado, take it away, my husband, Rabbi Yaakov Kalani. Welcome to our home in Jerusalem. We're prepared for the Seder night. And I'd like to share with you our ideas on how you can make it meaningful, you can make it enjoyable for your family and make it something you can grow and learn from. All right, we'll start with the order of the Seder. There are 15 steps through the night, they're in your Haggadah. They're probably on the first page. And in our family, we sing the first, we sing the 15 steps. And when we get to every step, we sing it again. So I'll start now to outline those 15 steps on our journey, our journey that goes from slavery to freedom, both remembering from long ago and a modern journey of going on spirit to spiritual freedom today. So let me start with the 15 steps. Kadesh Urchatz, Karpas Yachatz, Magid Rachza, Motzi Matza, Maror Korech, Shulchan Orech, Tzafun Borech, Halel Nirza, Kadesh. We're at the beginning now of making Kiddush. We're at the beginning of making Kiddush, and this is going to be where we talk about what is the purpose of the night. The purpose of the night, says the Kiddush, we are going to spiritual freedom. What does that mean? You're on your way tonight to being the best you. During the year, we're a slave to maybe bad habits. We're a slave to mistaken ideas. Whatever it is that holds us back, it's not a physical slavery that holds us back. I can't walk out the door tonight. I'd like to, and I'm not allowed to in Jerusalem. But what's real freedom is that I can be who I really am. I can be in touch with my spiritual and genuine self of what is the best part of me. That's where on the way tonight, and that's what Kiddush is about. So we're all gonna drink at the, during the night, four cups of wine, and it's four levels of freedom. Because we are like royalty, like sovereignty, that we are going to freedom, well, kings and queens generally don't pour their own bottles of wine. So I'm gonna ask the queen next to me to pour for me. Okay, you, do you want grape juice or red wine? I'm gonna have the wine. Okay, so I'm gonna pour for my husband. My husband's gonna pour for me. How much, how much wine should we be drinking, Rabbi? Well, if you're making the Kiddush, four ounces would be very good to drink, four ounces. 
And if you're looking to avoid getting drunk and avoid wine makes you sick, I would say even 2.2 ounces is going to do the trick. So that means no, just don't just take a sip when you, after, the, after the blessing. You've got to really drink it. There's another important point, and that is in former times, people were eating, they were sitting on the floor that, well, years ago, before I came to yeshiva, mm -hmm. I spent an evening with some Bedouins in Northern Israel. And when we're sitting on the 10th floor, boy, this was a long time ago, another lifetime ago, we're sitting on the 10th floor with these Bedouins and the gentleman that owned the tent, the uh, tent owner, I guess, <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he handed me a pillow and he handed me the pillow and I put it under my bottom and I sat on it. And they started laughing at me. They said, that's not the way that a mensch drinks. Might have been a little bit different in the Arabic and Hebrew that they were speaking. They said, you take the pillow and you lean to your left. And that is the way that a royal person would eat or drink. So we're going to make, I'm going to make part of the Kiddush. And you will see it in your Siddur that it talks about the season of our freedom and the holiday of Matzot. And we make the Borei Priya Goffin, and I'm going to be leaning to my left. It's a little bit funny to do it, but you're doing it to relive the coming out of Egypt. So I'm only going to recite the bracha on the wine and not the Kiddush. Boruch Eloheinu Melech Olam Borei Priya Goffin. Wow, that was good. I'll be a happier rabbi through the rest of the program now. <laughs> All right. Do you have to lean to your left? Look, it says in Jewish law that you should. And it says by women, it says that if a woman is an important woman, then she should lean. So you can be sure that my wife and all my daughters are leaning. Well, that was the beginning. Kadesh Urchatz. Orchats. This is coming to the washing. The washing for the, the next step. And properly what would happen here, the person that's leading the Seder, and in some homes, everybody does it. Some homes, everybody does it. That we do the ceremonial washing of the hands that usually inaugurates the eating of the meal. But at this time, we don't do it. And the idea is that the children are going to jump up and say, Abba, Tati, Daddy, why did we wash and not begin the meal? None of my kids ever said that even once, but <laughs> they're supposed to do it. At least that's what it says in the Haggadah. And we say, tonight is a different night than all the other nights. Usually we just go to dinner. Tonight we're going to be telling over the story of the Jewish nation, of where we come from and what our purpose is in the world. All right? So that washing inaugurates it. Kadesh Urchatz, Karpas, Karpas. Karpas is the vegetable that you'll have on the Seder plate or that you'll provide for people. And there's salt water, of course. We dip it in the salt water. Now, some people are going to tell you that you're remembering the tears of Egypt, and certainly you are, but I want to tell you what caused those tears. The Jewish nation, going back to our orig originators, people didn't get along with each other. There was envy, there was competition, and there was looking at the bad in people and not the good. It resulted in the selling of Joseph, and when all of that happened, that's when we came to the slavery of Egypt. This celery and the salt water is meant to remind us about the negativity of people either speaking badly about each other or looking at the bad in the next guy. Everybody has mistakes, but there's always a lot of good you can see in them. So for this part, we make a blessing, a Dhamma, and at our table, everybody makes the blessing together, beginning with Baruch, Together.
Baruch Ata Adoinoi Eloheinu Melech Olam Borei Bari Hadama. Oh, so so people get really really hungry if they think they're coming to your seder and 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 those even in your home. Um, and it's going to be a long time before you actually eat the meal. So the first time when we, we had guests for a Seder, like I remember they were like so hungry. They were like eating the celery to lunch, 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 lunch. But it's going to be a long time till the meal. So eat before you come to the Seder. You should have a light meal before going into the Seder because it's not a dinner party. You really want to tell the story. So make sure people are not famished going in. All right. Next step. karpas <laughs> yachat. Yachat! Wow. So what is yachat? We have three pieces of matzah here. Why do we have three? Three? Well, some people say it's the Kohen, the Levi, and the Israel. We always have two on Yom, on a holiday or on Shabbat. But for Pesach, we have the extra one. And we take, we take the middle one and... Show them. All right, there we are. We have the handmade matzah. It's more authentic. Looks like a pizza that went bad. <laughs> All right. And what I do, now you won't be able to do this like I do it. I'm a professional, but I do a very careful karate chop. Wow, amazing. And I've broken it in half. I take the larger part and I make it the, for later on the afikomen. That is the piece that's going to be eaten at the end of the meal. Now, what I do in our house, it might be the, not the exact way of doing it, but growing up with our children, I break off, I divide it into five pieces for each of our five children. And what I would do is I would put it into a wrap and I would hide each of the five pieces for those five children. They run around the house. They first, they leave the room and then they try to find it. It makes the Seder fun and they get a prize they extorted from me afterwards. Their big prize of the year, their big present of the year in our family, in a lot of Jewish traditional families, is not their birthday, because what the heck did they do on their birthday? I did all the work. <laughs> so their big prize is their Afi Komen prize. Why? Because they worked and they learned and they, they participated in the Seder. And so when, before they give the Afi Komen back to my husband, they bargain with them what they can get. And they can go big. They can go big at Pesach time. All right. So, so this year, who's going to find the Afi Komen? Me! <laughs> so my husband's going to hide it this year. We really are. And I'm going to go find it. My kids are probably laughing at the one right now. And I'm going to find it. And I already, already know what I want to ask him for. Um, so can I tell him? Well, I'd like to know. Okay, so this is what I'm going to ask him for. Because, you know, we usually go away. I haven't made pa Pesach in 18 years. And because we usually go away to a fancy resort because I'm one of the speakers there. And my husband's a speaker. So this year, obviously, this is not happening. So... I really have been thinking deeply about it, and I'm sure you've been thinking deep thoughts also about your life. And next year, God willing, I would like to have the Seder here in Jerusalem. I don't want to go to a resort, and I want to be able to somehow, please God, afford to bring all our, our kids here and somehow make it work. And that's, that's what I want for my Afikoma. So I'm already saying it in advance. All right, very good, very good. I hope that Afikoma uh, wish comes true. And I hope all my kids are listening. We're going on to the next step. Kadeshurchat, Karpas Yachat, Magid, Magid. We are at the central part of the Seder night. This is that Magid means telling. We're telling over the story of how the Jewish people went from slavery to freedom, from an oppressed nation to a great nation. And we begin now. First, we take the broken matzah and we say the words, this is the bread of affliction that our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. It continues on, I'm not gonna read it all, but it says, whoever is hungry, let them come and join us. The way you do that, since you're gonna be in your house and no one's gonna hear you be talking, the way you do that is between now and Seder night, take care of other people that might not be having the greatest Seder. They might not be with their extended family that they miss. 
So there's some people that don't have enough money. Make sure they have the money between now and Wednesday. Please get on that. And I learned a halacha recently. A man that is so poor, a man that's so poor that he goes begging door from door and has just the coins in his hand, he's still obligated to give money to other poor people. So even if you're feeling a little bit lonely right now, and there are a lot of us that are not going to be with the loved ones that we want to be with, before Pesach night, I was taught by a great rabbi, it's now that we reach out to people. It's now that we make them happy. Make those phone calls. Make that direct messaging. Get in touch with them. And even if you're feeling a little bit down, and sometimes I feel that way also, reach out and lift up other people now. So that's, so halacha means Jewish law. And so that's a beautiful thing to do to think of others at this time. And I do want to say that because of what's going on in the world today, if you've had conflict with people, if you've had maybe misunderstandings with people, so that's part of what's enslaving you. That's holding you back and holding the other person back. If there was ever a time, more than Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur ever, because of what's going on in the world, reach, I, we suggest reach out to people and try to make amends. People are very open right now, very. All right, at this point, we remove the Seder plate. We fill up the second cup. And I will fill up your second cup. Where's yours? Okay. I'll, I'll go for the wine. You're going to go for the wine? I'll be the happy rabbi tonight. Okay, you just gave me one. All right. <laughs> the happy rabbi. Okay. At this point, we do the, it's customary to do the four questions. Manishtana. So the youngest child should be the one that's doing it. But we give a, no, more than one child a chance or people that go around the Seder table. I remember my children would stand on a chair. They were little. They would recite the Manishtana, the four questions. This year, it'll be my wife standing on a chair in her high heels <laughs> doing it. All right? I'm the youngest. Part of what you get from the Manishtana is to get the children, they are the focal point, but anybody asking the questions. Asking questions is the focal point of tonight. Maybe we want to give the best answers we can, but being curious and asking questions is where we want to start. Our kids at the Seder, they would not get prizes for answers. They got prizes for questions because to be a Jew means to question and, and to struggle with those, to struggle with certain issues and keep questioning, keep questioning, never stop asking questions. All right. So we go through those questions and then you'll see in the Haggadah, it's giving more or less, it's giving answers to what is talked about. And you'll read in the Haggadah, it says we were slaves to, to Pharaoh in Egypt. And then it says there were great rabbis and they talked all night until the sun rose. They were partying all night. They had to interrupt them and tell them it's time for the morning prayers. What do you learn from that? They all knew the story in great detail. It was something that they, they weren't necessarily learning something new that night. When we talk about meaningful and important ideas, it, it solidifies our own understanding of those ideas. It makes it more real and meaningful to us. When you listen to other people talk about those ideas, even though you've heard them before, but hearing them again, hearing it in a different way that somebody else says it, it gets it to be more a part of your soul. That's what we're going for tonight. Let's talk about those important and meaningful things. And this year, because you have the visual aid of everything that's going on around, the interior minister of Israel said there's gonna be a curfew on Seder night. They don't want anybody going out. And in the book of Exodus, God says to everybody go into your homes and don't go out until the morning. And that was the first Seder. So even though you're saying the story that you said last year, it's a different world. And we're looking at it through, in, through different eyes. And so, and we see as we grow, we're always looking at wisdom through different eyes. Continuing in the Haggadah, we get to what's called, there's four attitudes of your children. There's the wise one, the wicked one, the simple one, and the one who's unable to ask. You know who those children are? They're you. At different times in your life, you're the wise one always asking questions or sometimes the cynical and mocking one. 
And sometimes where we don't care that much and we're a little bit, huh, what does that mean? And then the apathetic one, apathy is really the saddest one of them all. Looking at these four natures, it's teaching us when you speak at the Pesach Seder, don't be too tied to the exact words of the Haggadah. You're speaking to every person at the Seder table. Everybody has a different nature. Speak what's appropriate to them. I was at the Seder table of my Rosh Yeshiva nearly 40 years ago. Your rabbi. My rabbi, a great scholar. And I thought he would be giving the deepest understandings of the Haggadah. What did he do? He looked at his six-year-old son who was playing with a truck at the table. Rum, rum, rum. He looked at that son and he said to that son, I won't say his name. He said to him, you know what it would mean if you were a slave in Egypt? They take away your truck. He looked at an older brother and said to that older brother, you know what would happen to you if you were a slave in Egypt? You'd never get a driver's license. You talk to each one in the language that's appropriate to them. I can't hold back. I got to tell you about the wise son because that's the one you want to imitate. Being the wise son, he doesn't know anything. He asks, what's the wine? What's the matzah? What's the whole thing? But being wise means it's an attitude toward life, not an accumulation of knowledge. The attitude towards life is I'm humble and I want to grow. I'll say it again. A wise person, I'm humble and I want to grow. I can learn from anybody. If you have the attitude you can learn from anybody, you're immediately called a wise person. So that's what you want to encourage in your children, in the adults around you, and most deeply you want to encourage it in yourself. All right. We continue through the four children, and then we go on reading the Haggadah. I'm not going to read it through because you have it in front of you. It says, Vihisha Amna, and this is stood by our fathers and for us. The Haggadah was written over 2,000 years ago in a form that we recognize, certainly from the Mishnaic times, and really older. It says, it is this that is stood by our fathers and for us, that not only in, in, the, in every generation they have sought to annihilate us, in every generation they have sought to annihilate us. It was an old stereotype over two millennium ago that there was a lot of hatred toward the Jewish nation and people sought to annihilate us. I find at that time, I ask my guests, if they run into things of anti-Jewish feeling or what they run into personally and how they see it. And it doesn't have to be one-sided and don't tell people how they have to think or feel about it. I walk around Washington, D.C. when I was there a year ago, right after Pesach. I couldn't believe how kind and nice people were to me. They understood that I was a rabbi and people coming up to me with well-wishing. I don't mean to make it one-sided, but it's also the, it's be inviting us to think. Our neighbor in Toronto, Mr. Cohen was a Holocaust survivor. And Mr. Cohen told me that he, the song that's on this paragraph, he Sha'amda, it is stood by us. He was forced to sing by Nazi oppressors. They didn't know what he was singing. He sang this. It is this that has stood by us, that in every generation they sought to annihilate us, but we're the ones that relied on God and we're still standing and the others are gone. All right. Well, we get to a part of the Haggadah now. It goes through Jewish history. And here's what I'm going to tell you. A lot of my guests, they get a little bit less interested at this point. Some of them, they really want to read every word of the Haggadah, people like me. So I tell my guests, we're going to take a five or seven minute break now. People that want to read the Haggadah, we're going to continue on on our own. And those of you that want to say hello to the person on your left or your right, you can go ahead and do that. Take a social break now. I read the Haggadah. And I read it quietly and allow people to have their social time. We meet together a couple of pages later when we get to the glass of wine. And it says by the 10 plagues, 
that you are going to take out three drops of wine, blood and fire and columns of smoke. Fire, columns of smoke. Why are we taking the wine out? Why are we taking the, what a great question, Robinson. <laughs> Do I get a prize? <laughs> My understanding is, you know, we feel great pleasure when good things happen to good people. There is a certain pleasure that we saw the Nazi guards, we saw the Egyptians that oppressed us were greatly punished through the 10 plagues. But on the other side, our cup does not run us over with joy. So we take a few drops out of it to remember it's not the greatest pleasure. God, God did not create the Egyptians to choose evil, but they chose evil, but they were still created in God's image. So it was good that they died, but it's not, it's not so joyful either. All right, then we go to the 10 plagues. Blood, frogs, wild beasts. Okay. So you read them. So what do we do at the Palatnik table, Ima? Uh, so usually we have a lot of props. Like usually our table's filled with frogs and we have ping pong balls for the hail. But all our props are in North America. They're in the United States, in DC, probably in Ruth Barr's garage, because we thought we were going to be in the United States for, for Pesach, but God had other plans. So one of the, one of the I was looking for props. So one of the uh, plagues is wild beasts, like the beasts die. Okay, so this is a hippo. I collect hippos from Africa. I've been into, this is from Malawi, and this was from uh, uh, South Africa. This is from Cape Town. And so we, to, so this is our, this is what we're going to have on our table this year. So you can just take anything that you look at, look at all the the um, the uh, plagues, and you decide to bring props to it. After you've taken the ten drops of wine out of the cup, we get to what for me is my favorite part of the seder. Favorite part. Favorite part. Rav Yossi the Galilean said that there were fifty plagues at the sea. Rabbi Eliezer, it's a little bit like the World Series of Poker. Rabbi Eliezer goes, <laughs> rabbinical, 50, poker. rabbinical <laughs> poker. Rabbi Eliezer says, I see your 50 plagues, your 50 miracles, and I, ra I, I raise you to 200. Rabbi Akiva, it's over to you. A lot of drama. Rabbi Akiva sees 50 miracles, 200 miracles. He says, I raise you to 250 miracles and everybody else folds their cards. What are the rabbis arguing over? What, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? How many miracles there were when the Jewish people left the land of Egypt? I'll tell you what they're talking about. When we get goodness in this world, the more you break it up into its component parts, and the more you appreciate every detail, the more thankful you'll be, and the deeper love you'll have for God Almighty who grants it to us, or when you get good things from other people, the deeper is your love for those other people, and the deeper is your gratitude. Break it all up. A person can say, yeah, my mother, she raised me. Mazel tov, that was one thing. What else did your mother do? Well, my mother raised me, and I remember being in junior high, going through a hard time, and how kind she was to me. Okay, now you have two things. Well. You go through every different aspect, what that parent did for you, and it will increase your love. So here's what you're, I recommend that you should be doing at the Seder table. If you're blessed to be there with friends, with family, to talk about what you feel gratitude about. And I do it with my members of my family. As a married man, hey, all the married men out there, I'm telling you what to do. <laughs> you're going to look at your wife and you're gonna start listing all the things that you feel gratitude about to her. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're running out of time, I, but he will we're, have we're, to we're, we're running out of time. And I, I, I go <laughs> but he really does do it. I, okay. We're running out of time. And when I go around, I ask people, I ask people to say maybe what they're thankful about and get children to talk about it also. And even during what's going on in the world today, we have so, so much to be grateful for, so much. And I remember we came down, uh, I came down the other day and my husband said, they cut off the water. I go, there's no water? He goes, but there's Wi-Fi. And if you have to choose between water and Wi-Fi now, 
we would choose Wi-Fi. So even when everything is going on around us, we have so much to be grateful for. And it's good at this point in the Seder to stop and count your blessings. Counting your blessings, then we sing, Dai, Dai, Enu, Dai, Dai, Enu, Dai, Dai, Enu, Dai, Enu, Dai, Enu. It's all about gratitude. And the rabbis teach us, Dai, Enu means it's enough for us. Nothing was owed to me. The Almighty God does not owe me anything, and I take pleasure for everything I have. The enemy of gratitude is when we feel it's owed to me, that we want to look at everything to be a gift. And I think this year, more than ever, we realize and we're starting to appreciate the things that we never appreciated before, or how we're going to appreciate just being able to go outside, just being able to buy something. It's, it's amazing the things we took for granted, and it's something to talk about when you get to Diana. So I see that our guests are getting very hungry and you want to get to the meal. Yeah, time is going. All right, so I'm going to go a little bit quicker. This is the most important part of the meal that you have to, you must do. Rabban Gamliel used to say, if you haven't said these three things, Pesach, Matzah, Maror, you haven't done the mitzvah. There's a mitzvah to tell everybody the story. You've got to say these three concepts, Pesach, Matzah, and Maror. The Pesach was the lamb that was slaughtered by the Jewish people, every family, and they took the blood and they put it on the doorposts. And in the original Pesach, we were told, you put the blood on the doorpost. You may not walk out of the house. The angel of death is walking in the streets. You must remain in your home and God will skip over your home because he will see the blood. What is the idea there that he's gonna pass over your house? It wasn't because he didn't know who was Jewish. He knows who's Jewish. He looks at the doorbell, Rosenbaum, Goldberg, Silverman. He knows who's Jewish. What is the idea of having the blood on the doorpost? You have to choose to be a Jew. I know you feel it in your heart, everybody, but it's not enough to be a cardiac Jew. We have to do things that show the world and show ourselves and put it into action that we care about being Jewish. We really do it. That's the symbol of the Pesach. The matzah, matzah, of course, that we know. It's the symbol of freedom. It's the symbol of freedom, excuse me, the symbol of freedom that we were in a rush to get out of Egypt. What does that mean? You should be in a rush a little bit in order to change spiritually. When you have an insight in life that you wanna be a better person, when you have an insight, I can grow in this kind of a way, don't do it tomorrow, don't do it manana. Even while you're stuck in the house, even during the whole corona thing, try to make that change right now. That was the idea of the matzah, moving quickly, no time for the bread to rise. And the third part is maror. Maror is the bitter herb and it reminds us, thank you, it reminds us that not achieving our potential can be bitter in life. Freedom is to be the best person I can be, the fullest person I can be. Bitterness is taking it easy, not being fulfilled, not working very hard. Remember that that slavery can be bitter. Sometimes we look back and we say, oh, those were the good old days before marriage, before kids, before I grew Jewishly. No, 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 those weren't the good old days. These are the good days. And as we conclude this part of the Seder, I'm not gonna say the blessing again, but you will at the Seder. Borei Puri Hagafen. I lean to the left, because now I'm really free. have more of my wine, and now I'm really the happy rabbi. And we go to the next stage of the Seder. We get up and everybody goes to wash. That's the proper thing to do. We're like not gonna what? do it, but that's what we do. You wash for the bread, or you wash in this case for the matzah. Then we come out. And how well, much matzah should we eat? One person, I'll tell you in a moment, one person says, Hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Okay, got it? No, Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go, Asher Kiddushanu, but mitzvot sabit zivanu. Ala chilat matzah, on the eating of matzah. And then you, did you put salt on it? 
We put salt on it, okay? And if you're going for the- uh, Why do we put salt on it? If you're going for the gold medal, if you're going for the gold medal, you would eat about a half of one of these. Some people say, you know what, Rabbi, I don't think I can eat that much. I'm only gonna eat a quarter of one of, uh, a quarter of one of these. So you'll have that amount. When you're eating it, excuse me, you'll be on your left side. You'll be on your left side. And as you're doing it. You might've lost us, we're back. Okay. A little bit of a technical glitch there. <laughs> All right. But you'll be eating, leaning to your left. No one talks. It's the mitzvah of coming out of Egypt in a hurry. That was the plague of darkness. The plague of darkness, <laughs> okay. All right, so we continue on. We're eating, it's a little bit uncomfortable. It's also a little bit funny, and we're all doing that together, and you should eat it in a few minutes without really talking about other things. Crunch, 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 crunch. That is the mitzvah of matzah. Then we continue, we go. The next one is maror. I'm not gonna sing all the steps. Maror. And maror, you have about three or four of these. And you, again, you don't lean for this. You dip it in the haroset? Dip it in the haroset. We don't want the bitterness to be complete. And then we shake, shake it, it off. off. We eat it sitting straight, remembering the bitterness of Egypt. And then the next one we do like Hillel, we take uh, about a quarter of a matzah, not even, and break it and make a sandwich with the maror and the matzah. And we dip it in the haroset and we shake it off again. All right. How are we doing? Let's We're move. doing great. Okay. <laughs> At this point, we go to the main meal. We go to the main meal yeah. and everybody enjoys the main meal. I'm not going to have the meal right now, but you go through that That's enjoying. So and I'm going to say something uh, a little bit off script, but I hope it should be a special meal where you really pay attention to friendship, to meaningful conversation. And if you're blessed enough that you're at a table with children, you should be giving uh, special attention to them, not that the grown-ups are talking to each other. And I'm gonna make a request, yeah? There should be no phones at this Pesach Seder. You know, if you're keeping Jewish law, that's taken for granted. But even people that say, well, I'm not that religious, but at the Seder night, you can be there without the phones. Disconnect in order to connect. We continue on. You get to the Birchat HaMazon and the blessing after meal. It's fun to say, even if you only say one paragraph because it's too hard for you. You do that. And at the conclusion of the Birchat HaMazon, the, the uh, grace after meal, we have the third cup of wine. We say the Borei Priya Goffin. I'm not going to drink now because it's not Purim, it's Pesach. And <laughs> you'll drink the third cup. At that time, we get to the next part of the cup of Elijah. Elijah is going to tell us when Mashiach is about to come. My father used to say, when you pour this cup and you open the front door to see if the Mashiach is there, if there's a man there standing in a long robe and a staff, He's there to tell you the Chicago Cubs are about to win the World Series. Okay, so since <laughs> the Cubs, did. so Mashiach is undoubtedly <laughs> is definitely coming, uh, coming very yeah. soon. We do the yeah, final Mashiach part. Is the, Mashiach is the Messiah. Thank you, Messiah. Elijah is, yeah, Eliyahu is Elijah. We do the final part of Hallel, if you know it, to sing it. I'm going to tell you a lot of my guests leave at that point when I start singing Hallel. Maybe it's in response to the way that I sing. No. Maybe it's because it's usually about 10 after one <laughs> when I get to this part of the Seder. But they did great. And I tell them if they stay for 15 minutes more, they will get the t-shirt. I stayed for the whole Seder at the Palatnik family, but I give them a way that they can comfortably leave. Nobody's I, leaving now. Nobody's leaving They're in Jerusalem. Just leaving your room. You're leaving Jer the dining room. In Jerusalem, the police are out. They do not want people You going have a to captive Seder. audience at your Seder this year, a captive audience. All right. We get to the conclusion of the Hallel, and as we're singing the final verses of it, you're reading through the Haggadah. 
You now re drink a little bit, the fourth cup. Fourth cup. 2.2 .2 ounces on all of them. Mm. Make sure you get a wine that you enjoy drinking. And then we get to Nirza, the Nirza. final step. Nirza, the final step of the night. That we thank Hashem, we thank God that we've completed the Seder. And we sing at the end of it, make it fun for your children, for your guests. And we if you're by yourself, if you're by yourself, you're allowed to sing by yourself. And okay. dance by yourself. Okay. I saw something recently. I sent it to my wife. It said that what is it that you should dan dance with? Dance like you're always alone. Sing like you're always alone. And write your emails like a lawyer is going to read them. Okay. <laughs> so we sing, and I sing, next year in Jerusalem. Lashana haba. Be Yerushalayim, Lashana, Abba, Be Yerushalayim. Even if you're by yourself, you should be singing that. And if you're lucky enough and blessed enough that you're in your Jerusalem, you should be singing knowing it should be a rebuilt Jerusalem where all the Jewish people gather And you're together. all invited to our Seder in Jerusalem next year. Yeah, all, all of you. All of you. Yeah, everybody comes. <laughs> all right. At the conclusion of the night at the Palatnik family, we sing a traditional song, and you should too. There's Kad Gad Ya, Kad Gad Ya. But we sing, who knows one, it's my favorite, and it goes, we've done it in a particular way for the Palatnik family. It's our family song. It's our favorite family song, because it goes, who knows one, we know one. One is Hashem God, one is God, one is Hashem in the heavens and the earth. And it adds a number for each one traditionally. We've added our own numbers, and it goes like this. Who knows 20? We know no, 20. 20. 20 other generations from Adam to Abraham. 19 are the blessings in the prayer, Shmon Esrei. 18 is the Shmon Esrei. 17 in Tammuz is the day we fast. 16 the day in Nisan, we start to count the Omer. 15 are the steps in a Pesach Seder. 14 are the books of the Rambam. 13 are the Midot of Hashem. 12 are the tribes of Yisroel. 11 are the stars in Joseph's dream. 10 are the Aseret. Hadid wrote, 9 are the months until a baby's born. And 8 are the days of a Brit. And 7 are the days of the week. 6 are the orders of the Mishnah. And 5 are the books of the Torah. And 4 are the mothers. And 3 are the fathers. And 2 are the Lufa that Moshe brought. One is a sham, one is a sham, one is a sham. <laughs> ah. In the heavens and the earth, we go till 50. Not one of my guests has ever remained for 50. <laughs>